Welcome members to uh, our first attempt at some sort of a, a podcast slash uh, meet the press slash some sort of a remote conversation uh, with the golf staff at Westmore Country Club. Uh, we've got Vince Polizano here, Andrew Jeppy in the bottom right hand corner, Jason Tipton in the top left hand corner, and Molly Braid in the bottom left all the way from New Hampshire. Um, so the, the whole purpose of this is for us, because uh, we miss everybody, to provide uh, you an opportunity to get to know us a little bit more. So uh, I'm going to lead off the conversation here, and uh, we'll kind of see where things go. And uh, I'll start with Molly. Uh, Molly, why did you get into to golf? What got you into playing golf? You know, how old were you? Where were you? All those different things. Yeah, so my first memories of golf, I was in... Uh, New Hampshire, Vermont growing up and took golf lessons and golf clinics with my older siblings and older cousins at the local country club. I uh, did that for a few years and then I actually played a lot of other sports and didn't pick up a golf club that often but I uh, came back to it in high school and played in a lot of uh, charity events, scrambles with my dad and his friends and kind of picked up some momentum there and then decided I wanted to take it pretty seriously and, and practice as much as I could then and you know, went into college golf from there and tried to keep playing through. Uh, once I got teach, or I should say, once I got teaching, I stopped playing. Um, and then as an adult, I uh, got back into golf again after marrying Alex. There you go. All right, we all start somewhere. How about you, Jason? Yeah, so I grew up uh, pretty much all baseball. Uh, family was a baseball family. My cousins were uh, also baseball. So I really didn't have any aspirations into golf. Um, however, my grandparents were huge golfers. My uncle was a huge golfer. Um, and my grandpa was a ranger at one of the public courses. And like once a year, we got to go out with my grandparents play 18 holes of golf, and I mean, we do like some driving range time uh, throughout the year as well from time to time, but we, I, I remember just always looking forward to that one day we got to play 18 holes with my grandparents, so that kind of like, it stuck with me because we did it almost every year, um, and then once I got to high school, uh, again, baseball guy, but for, uh, in Illinois, baseball is in the spring. So in the fall is uh, boys and girls golf. So uh, my parents were like, yeah, just go off to the golf team. Like you like to play, like you don't play that much, but you like it. And, you know, just, just do it. It's something to do because there's nothing really going on for baseball. Then. I was like, okay, great. So once I did that, I, I was pretty hooked on it, to be honest with you. And um, that's when I kind of started taking uh, lessons is – like formal lessons, it was after my freshman year. Um, and I had a pretty good experience there. And somehow, some way, throughout high school, baseball kind of went like this, and golf kind of went like this. And um, I, I ended up going to a golf college uh, after high school because I thought that's something I could see myself doing as a career. And, um, you know, once I got to the college, I, I found out how much I love to teach. Um, and you know the rest is history and i found myself a home at westmore and and now i try to play as much as i can but you know i'm, I'm really just into the teaching side now awesome now would you say tippy was it hard to transition from baseball to golf because it's two different swings um i always kind of thought that um while i was doing it I kind of wish I had a different mindset. I think there's a lot of similarities uh, between the two swings uh, that I didn't really think about, nor that I have someone tell me about. Um, but yeah, it was a little bit difficult with the wrong mindset. Uh, but I mean, athletes are just going to be athletes and they'll kind of figure it out. And I just kind of figured it out. Try to. It's interesting though. I know Andrew, your background, we'll hear it in a second, but it's interesting hearing from Molly and, and Jason and, and me too, when we get to me, it, none of us grew up playing golf like as an infant, right? Like we, that, that wasn't, that wasn't us. We weren't, you know, in junior golf programs at the age of three. Like that just wasn't our, our things. We were all uh, athletes per se and kind of 
other areas. Andrew, what's uh, what's your story? So I guess to, to take a way back, my uh, stepdad would always take us on Thanksgiving Day, so there was either snow or not snow on the ground, to Little Creek Golf Course, which was this kind of really terrible executive course in Pennsylvania next to a uh, paper plant, so it smelled horrible. Uh, but we would go there and then kind of got to high school and, and maybe played once a summer. And after I graduated, played a couple times in the summer. But uh, kind of fast forward, uh, 23, 24 at the time, and uh, I met a coworker who was really into golf and said, hey, look, I don't know what you're doing this summer, but we're always looking for guys to join us. And uh, we played probably 20 rounds in the first eight weeks, and I was hooked. And we played 75 to 80 rounds for the first three years uh, with that, amassing 95 courses in Wisconsin and Illinois. Um, and, and it really started with me shooting 100, 105, and tired of getting my butt kicked from my buddy shooting 73s, 74s. So I just got better and got better to uh, finally uh, take him down last year. It was a big accomplishment for me. I hate even some some rounds, but uh, yeah, so that I kind of caught the golf bug and decided to get out of the service industry and say, hey, look, you know, what can I use my skills with and, and be passionate and fun? Um, so I decided to to go into a career in golf, and so far it's been a been absolutely wonderful and fantastic. Well, you're still in the yeah. service industry that hasn't left yet. It's just well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> just right? slinging food. <laughs> right. Andrew, that's that's pretty impressive. You uh, when you were first starting to play and actually play a decent amount, you're shooting like 105. I think I was shooting like I, I actually I don't think I could count that high. To be perfectly honest with you, you, sure. <laughs> you took down 95 courses. How in like a short amount of time? How many golf balls was that? I mean, for me, that was <laughs> too many. I was playing. You know, you could buy, uh, you can go on Amazon and get, Vince doesn't want me to tell this, but you could buy really cheap reused Pro V1s on Amazon. That's Yeah, that's well, we, we don't want to go there. We always <laughs> sell new stuff at Westmore Country Club. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, I know, like for me, so I, I kind of, like everybody else, I didn't start out playing golf until I was a little bit older. I was a sophomore in high school, and uh, I finally found out that I was uh, no good at soccer when I didn't make the varsity team. <laughs> and so uh, a, a fellow um, a friend of mine who was also cut uh, said, hey, I've been playing golf for a while. I want to go play. So we went to this rundown uh, par three course called Weber Park in Skokie, Illinois, and, uh, and went. And I'll never forget, I, I, nine holes, par three. I mean, like the longest hole is 130 yards, right? Uh, I, I, I don't know what I shot. It was a lot. And I do remember distinctly saying, okay, like I could do better than that. And this is all when like Tiger Woods won the masters. And so golf was just like, you know, exploding and it's everywhere. And it's a little more relevant, uh, especially in Skokie, Illinois. Right. And, uh, and so we, uh, we went out, we played and I got hooked up and, uh, went to some really bad clinics and, and really bad golf pros who were teaching these really bad lessons, but I had some sort of an athletic ability, right? So I kind of figured it out along the way and got some more help down the road. Uh, and then stumbled upon Ferris State and the PGM program. And uh, one thing leads to another. And, and now all I do is eat, sleep, and, and, and drink golf. And uh, it's become my life and my family's life. And, and my parents didn't even play golf. And so my dad started playing golf uh, in his 80s. I mean, he's, he's 93 now. He didn't start playing until he was 80 years old, right? Because I got into it. So it's just gone from our family growing up. I mean, it was just never a thing. Uh, and now it's it's like the thing in our family. So it's, it's pretty incredible and just, you know, fortunate to have Westmore be a part of it. But um, enough about that with golf and Andrew, you've played a bunch of, you've probably made, played more golf courses in Wisconsin than uh, Jason, Molly and me combined. Uh, yeah. let's talk about the favorites. Uh, Andrew, lead us off. What's your favorite golf course that you've ever played bar none? Oh man, you're going to be really disappointed by this because it's not in Wisconsin. Uh, I'd say, and I haven't traveled much for golf just because I'm new to it. Um, but I'd say my first top 100 course was one of the first courses I got to play and it was Arcadia Bluffs. Um, and I thought it was just a spectacular kind of, it, it's a great venue. It's similar to the Straits, uh, but all those dunes are natural. Um, they didn't, you know, bring in all the dump trucks. So you, it kind of has that feel of, of natural beauty um, sweeping. You have crevasses between par threes 
and vistas overlooking Lake Michigan. And I always, I thought it was just a spectacular experience. And um, I did that at the very start of my golf career. So there's this itch and this urge to go back and, and experience Arcadia Bluffs again, as well as uh, their new South course which is uh, similar to a place you like to play, Vince, in Chicago. Yeah, we'll talk about that. But yeah. fun fact about Arcadia Bluffs, so, so that opened when I was at Ferris State in Michigan. Our Arcadia Bluffs, for those that don't know, is basically right across the lake from, from Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And, and some say there is a debate as to which one, uh, why Whistling Streets was built, and because Arcadia Bluffs was there first. But anyway, um, they lost, it's, it's been rerouted a couple times, but I think it's the 12th or 13th hole, it's a par three over this big ravine that you're talking about with the Lake Michigan in the background. They lost that green into Lake Michigan when they were building it the first time. They literally, wow. all the golf course instruction guys went home and they came back and the foreman or the superintendent or the, the designer did a little morning site tour and they said, well, where's the 13th green? <laughs> they lost it into Lake Michigan. So they had to like start over. Uh, oh, wow. I don't know how That's they crazy. did it or what they did, but it's, it's, if you actually go, if you play it again, you go back there and you look down, you can see just junk everywhere. It's still just runoff from, from what they had. Um, I didn't know that. The yeah, Arcadia is incredible. It's, it's such a cool place. And the cool thing about Arcadia Bluffs too, if you look it up online, um, the 18, you have the clubhouse and then you have this lawn and then the 18th green and the entire golf course out towards Lake Michigan. Well, they, they set up these big, massive, like 100 pound Andorongdeck chairs on this lawn. And inevitably, if you play in the afternoon, you know, the sun is setting over Lake Michigan and you sit there and you watch people come up 18 and you kind of give them a little bit of applause and all that stuff. And uh, it's a great place to uh, have a cocktail and kind of watch the sun go down and see how well people played the 18th hole. Molly, what about you? be the hardest question I've ever been asked uh, and I have so many answers but uh, I guess if I had to choose one I would say New South Wales over in Sydney um, I haven't played it a ton but sort of like the I guess you could say Pebble Beach of Australia and it has a run of you know probably five or six holes that are just unforgettable and similar right on the ocean you know got the crevices and the greens that are out there right totally exposed and just unbelievable views um still has those holes uh, throughout that you want to just forget about um so i'm actually really excited uh tom Hope's over there i think redoing a few of the holes so hopefully it uh makes it so there's 18 really good ones <laughs> So that's, uh, I, I know your ties to Australia because of your husband, but what, um, uh, have you played any others out there? Because I know for me, a big bucket list is Royal Melbourne. I, I would love to play Royal Melbourne and uh, the composite course, of course, um, but, but still. So, so do you have any other ones you've played there that are a highlight? Yeah, so actually next door to New South Wales is um, Michaels and very similar golf course, just uh, hasn't had the, the history and the big... Uh, Big tournaments there so it's a fantastic track and great views down on the ocean again um we also played uh lakes which is down by the airport uh, i think it was 45 degrees celsius so maybe 110 fahrenheit and we wow. did I, I think alex finished all 18 holes i think i ended up in the sprinklers for a few of them but uh another really well-known track out there and uh not quite comparable to the ones out on the ocean for me, but uh, another good track. So um, it's funny how how atmosphere is kind of a part of, I know Andrew's story, right? I mean, Arcadia Bluffs, the atmosphere there is incredible and the ocean, you know, hearing from Molly and stuff like that. So it is how much of it is is experience and atmosphere versus agronomy practices and how well conditioned it is or vulnerability like you birdie the last three holes clearly that golf course is going to resonate in your mind more so than a place where you may have played poorly right so Jason what about what about you like as you're evaluating and, and letting the group know I mean is it the golf course design is it you know how well you played is it a combination I mean could you see through maybe a a poor round of golf, but a really, really cool place or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I, 
personally, um, just kind of growing up playing the courses I played, they're never really in great shape necessarily. So I'm, I'm maybe not as keen or has a keen of an eye to like course conditions and agronomy practices. Uh, for me, it's a lot of kind of sites and, and kind of overall experience at the course, you know, if, if the staff was, you know, an awesome staff and like really made you feel welcome. And, and I, I think any course you play, like how you play is, is going to affect it. Right. And so like you could be on the best, you know, conditioned course, whatever that means in the country. But if you fire a 115, you're used to firing 75, you're going to come up with some reason why that course wasn't any good. Sure. Right. Um, yeah. A, a lot of it, I think has to do with like just our human senses to like how we played and like the feels you had when you were there. Yeah, for sure. So, so what's, what's your favorite then? Let, let's hear it. Yeah. My, uh, I've actually, it's changed. So it used to be uh, for a long time, this place called thoroughbred golf club in Michigan, it was actually attached to a dude ranch. Um, but this course, you, you, uh, hotel room we had was like pretty much right on the course. You walked out of the back, you were on the range. They're, they might have done like 20 rounds a day, and that's because they were on a new ranch and everyone's riding horses. Um, but it's such a cool course because you literally just played through the backwoods of Michigan. Every tee seemed to be elevated. Or you're hitting over. I mean, it was such a cool experience overall i mean the the golf shop was about the size of my kitchen and the guy that was checking you in also cooked you a hot dog at the turn it was it was awesome <laughs> um but it, it has changed though because a couple years ago i was fortunate enough to take a couple of our members uh to a bmw tournament down at pinehurst uh and i played pinehurst number two and again i mean it it, it was it was really well conditioned the whole deal but they have really switched their theory of conditioning the golf course there's a lot more kind of waste area there now it, it's a little bit rougher around the edges which I kind of like um but I mean you're at Pinehurst right all the the history and it, it is to this day the only place where I sat in my hotel room and actually watched the infomercial channel uh that they put out <laughs> Oh, That's well, Pinehurst is all about the greens. You're exactly right. I mean, those green complexes are incredible. I was just there a couple of weeks ago with uh, with our club president, Mike Schmidt, and I've played there a couple of times now. And, and yeah, number two is just, it's all about the greens. And, and it is certainly rough around the edges, but there's so much history with Donald Ross and his home is right there off of the third green and things like that. And of course, everything that goes into Pinehurst, the community, the resort, it's, it's, it's a special place. It's yeah, little for anyone that goes to Pinehurst and plays number two and has a caddy, if they tell you to putt for 30 feet left or right, do it because they know what they're talking about. I, I, it only took one time for me to hit it 10 feet to the left instead of 30 feet, and I'm pretty sure I chipped it off the green when I should have putted it. And <laughs> that was the last oh, wow. time I listened to the caddy all day. I think that happened on, like, the second hole. So, luckily, that happened to be pretty early. Sure. Yeah, those guys know what they're talking about. They, they have to because uh, that golf course. And it was funny when we were just there a couple weeks ago, um, the, the caddy we had, we had him when we played the number four course and the number two course had the same caddy both days. I asked him, I said, so, you know, because there's nine golf courses. Actually, I think ten now because they bought another one. Uh, how often do you caddy at the others? He said it's basically 70% of the rounds he does are number two. Now, he's a he's a professional caddy, right? So, like, he's there for the experience of Piners number two and number four, where most of the tourists are coming to play. And so he said it's basically all out there. So but not, not a bad place to walk around all day long, right? Yeah, but I am very, very interested in hearing from the guy that has virtually played everywhere. So it seems, what is, uh, what's your story there, Vince? So it's funny because we, we scripted these questions. I was thinking about this um, today for a bit, and, and I'm going to pull a page out of, I think all of our books, uh, but I'm, I'm especially on Andrew on this one. So uh, I, I think it's like food, right? Like you, you can you can go to um, 
any restaurant and you can have a great experience, right? Like when I was in college, I thought Applebee's was the coolest place in the world, right? But then you're like your palate changes and your price point changes and, and all that stuff, right? And so, so I've been fortunate to play a lot of great places. I'm kind of a golf architecture nerd, but I can see past uh, the conditioning. I can see past the ocean. I can see past all the other stuff because I'm looking for like architectural values. Now you, you can't have, you know, greens that are dead and things like that. But if it's a little rough around the edges, kind of like Pinehurst is, that's okay. Um, uh, but f so for me uh, in America, the, my favorite is uh, Chicago Golf Club. Uh, obviously it's in Chicago. I'm not just saying that because I'm like a Bears fan or I'm a homer, but uh, Charles Blair McDonald is the, um, the designer. There are not many CB McDonald's out there and it is one of, if not the best next to national golf links of America, which I've not played, but, um, CB McDonald is, is a fantastic designer. He basically brought all of the template holes, uh, from Scotland, uh, and Ireland and, and built a compilation course at national golf links, but he first did it kind of in the original routing of Chicago Golf Club. And so uh, it's fantastic. Uh, a little birdie told me that maybe in the near future, a US Open might be there. So if that's the case, I'm gonna spend every waking minute walking the golf course. Uh, but no, you're right, I'm, I'm lucky. I've played a bunch of cool places. But you know, I was thinking about the food comment too, right? There's a place called the Palmetto Club uh, in Aiken, South Carolina, that not many people have heard of. The place has been around since like 18 whatever. They have a gravel parking lot. They, they don't have much, um, but that used to be the tour stop when the tour like went week to week and guys would hop in their cars and drive. Uh, they did a, a two-day pro-pro event there um, following the Masters tournament. And so all of these guys have played and competed at the Palmetto Club. In fact, holes um, three, four, and five are three par fours in a row, and uh, or maybe it's two, three, and four. I can't quite remember. It's two, three, or four, or three, four, five. Regardless, Ben Hogan is on record saying it's the three hardest stretch of holes in a row he's ever played in his life, and it is unbelievable what these golf holes are like. So, um, I mean, I could go on with golf courses forever, but it's just so, interesting, you know. Funny story about the Palmetto Club. Now, I don't know how necessarily true this is. It's coming from probably a friend of a friend that used to work there or whatever, but uh, I heard a story uh, in a video I watched about the Palmetto Club that it was so exclusive back when it was first opened and, and like Bean Crosby was playing that, like it was like top of the top. If you weren't a member, you weren't playing. And I guess one of the presidents, maybe like Eisenhower or something called up, it's like, yeah, you know, I'm, I, I want to make tea time. And the guy in the shop's like, well, what's the last name? Is, you know, Eisenhower, whoever it was. He goes, no, that's not on the member list. He didn't let him play. The president. How is that possible? Uh, it's a cool place. And they uh... – you know, so there, there's, it's, it's kind of, you talked about cool places. Like now I'm kind of remembering it. Like, so like you, you're on the first hole and you're teeing off. It's a big downhill par four that goes way, way down. And in the landing area on the right, in total, forget slice territory. It's like in fade territory. It's right off the first fairway is the 15th green. And so kind of the way it works there is, is as you're on the tee, you essentially have to wait for the 15th green to clear. Once they get off 15, they wait for you, and they essentially four caddy for you, teeing off on one. And then after they do that, we had to, we were instructed to wait because they hit back towards what the first tee is, towards like the, the fifth or 16th green, it's par three. And they hit back up that way. So you kind of do this double four caddy thing with, with the members, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, but anyway, you could, well, we could talk about this stuff forever. I don't want to take up anyone's time too long. We're just under a half hour here. But, um, you know, on behalf of, of Molly and Jason and Andrew and, and myself, uh, I don't know if we're going to do this a whole heck of a lot because well, eventually we're going to be getting into real golf at Westmore Country Club. But uh, this is just our way to, to kind of keep the members of Westmore Country Club engaged. And uh, thank you for, for killing some time with us. We hope that it was a little entertaining for you. We're going to try and do this once a week with different topics and different staff members and things like that. So uh, any parting words of wisdom before we, uh, we let everyone go here? No parting words. 
just uh, <laughs> I just think that uh, I think we're all itching uh, just as much as you guys membership uh, watching down that lens to, to get back and just uh, keep staying patient and uh, hopefully this will all be over sooner rather than later and we'll get to talk about this stuff in person. Well, yeah, thank you for listening in and uh, thanks Vince for putting this all together. Well, yeah, you're welcome. And, and, and Molly, I can't believe that we made it a half hour without any of our kids interrupting us. That's quite the achievement right there. Oh, high five, Vince. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See you later, Westmore. We'll uh, hopefully see everyone really soon. Bye-bye.